Leadership in this world of conflicted interests and polemic politics, we need it more than ever. But in a post-industrial networked age, we seem to want more bottom-up than top-down. The Arab Spring, the Tea Party, and Occupy Wall Street demonstrate the power of leaderless phenomenons. So how do we reconcile having less control with retaining inspiring command over an organization? And does a more collaborative approach give the community-oriented Pacific Northwest a competitive advantage on the global stage? As we'll learn from a visionary entrepreneur and an inspirational soccer coach, it's about designing a new model for motivation. I'm Hanson Hossein. Welcome to Four Peaks. Peter Fewing has mastered the peak of community. He coached Seattle University's men's soccer team to national championships in both 1997 and 2004. He has brought the joy and discipline of soccer to so many kids over the last three decades through his popular soccer camp. And Peter has just co-written a book on leadership on and beyond the pitch, which begs the question, what's the secret to his coaching success? Peter, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. So you've been around leadership soccer for decades. How has the concept of leadership changed for you during this time? Well, athletes have changed, and athletes' input has become much more important to the success of a team. When I was a kid growing up, it was coach says jump, you say uh, how high. Now, if coach says jump, they want to know what the work to rest ratios are. They want to know when the next game is. If we're jumping too close to game, they want to know the surface they're jumping on. So you have to be able to answer those questions before they ask. So, so what's that all about? Why yeah. have the athletes actually changed? What's given them the, the impetus to actually be so forward and actually question the coach? Lack of fear. They don't fear the coach anymore. So you have to earn their respect. And it's not, you know, top down. It is, it, players have information. They have access to information. They're not afraid to speak their opinions and so you have to work with them in order to get the most out of them. So for you this must be a cultural shift as a leader. Well it is. I'm young enough to it to not have it be a huge impact and it, my nature as a coach and a leader is not so much top down. I do want to get uh, opinions from the players so I'm, I'm willing to listen to them but it is definitely a shift. You have to explain a lot more in advance at the beginning of practice as to how the session will go in order for it to be successful. So since you've experienced both cultures, both the traditional more yeah. top down and this more, I don't know, consultative, which one do you prefer? I like the latter. I'm fine with it. Now, they still need leadership. They still need someone to step up and say, this is how hard we're going to work. This is where we're going to go. Sometimes you have to say, no, we're not going to do it the way you would like it to go today. But I like their input. And really, the only way you're going to succeed is if you get the athletes to buy in. Okay. It sounds very interesting because it sounds to me because they have more information, some of that information is coming from their use of technology, right? They can, they're probably yeah. watching games on television, they're getting tips from internet, they're talking to their friends on social media. So there's this, there's this technological factor involved in this change in leadership. It yeah, like. absolutely. They can go online and Google what Manchester United's doing at practice. And if they say, hey, you know, Sir Alex Ferguson is doing this at training, why aren't we doing this at training? You do have a lot more competition to be successful as a coach. Other coaches doing good things you sometimes have to follow along with them so so in yeah. the technology world there's this cliche it sounds like now that you should fail early fail fast and that's part of success it took you 10 years to win your yeah. first championship at Seattle University do we need some time to bake in success and, and through leadership? Do you need time to be a good leader? You do need time to be a good leader. I think, I think you reach your prime. I think I'm 49 right now, and I think I'm in my prime years of leading because I have experience to draw from. Uh, I have confidence to draw from. But I, I think it does take time. Mike Krzyzewski at Duke, where they, they won their first national championship in basketball, 10 years. John Wooden, UCLA, 16 years before they won their first. And it's a, you've got to get the culture right. You know, when a team loses a game uh, or loses a playoff game, they come back the next year hopefully more determined. So it takes time to build that trust. It takes time to build that experience. Uh, it can't be an overnight thing. So how do you teach 
the leader's leader, the people who are expecting results, how do you teach them patience to say, you know what, it's not going to happen in my first year here as a coach? You have to work your tail off. You have to, you have to give them no. You've got to work so hard that they can't question what you're doing, to be honest with you. So if I'm, if I'm a coach and I have an owner, uh, I have to put in the time and do such an efficient job and such a thorough job that they can at least say, okay, he's giving it his best. And then you've got to communicate above you let them know that you are doing the work. It's amazing because you think in this attention-starved world where you want results immediately, that that kind of patience doesn't exist anymore. It's, it is, the, the window is a lot shorter. It's a much shorter window. I think, you know, in the professional world, three-year contracts, you can be happy with those. Four-year contracts are very unusual, so people want re results quickly. You spent most of your life in soccer itself. Yeah. Is there something specific or special about soccer and its relationship with leadership? Well, it is unique. It's not, uh, it's a sport that requires, it's sort of Plato's Republic. Every job is important, right? And, and no job is more important than the other. Uh, and so you need an entire team to be successful. One superstar cannot take on, we have 11 on each side, right? One guy by himself against another team of 11 has no chance. So everybody has to do their job. So how does, how do you take that how do you take the lessons they're learning in soccer and, and leadership and success, how does that translate to real life? After we won our second championship in this picture right here, about 20 minutes after that picture was taken, I said, hey, here's what you've learned this season. You've learned about self-talk. You've learned about goal setting, visualization. You've learned about uh, trust. You've learned how to believe. You've learned how to be disciplined and sacrifice. And, and I said, and, and as a national champion, only 100 guys are going to get rings this year. Right? Well, you can be a national champion husband, father, community guy, employee, and a national and champion uh, employer as well. Well, in fact, there's a great line in your book that the majority of student leaders will become future leaders elsewhere. Yeah. So when you're actually coaching a team, no matter how old your players, do you have that, that horizon in mind? Absolutely. Absolutely. We've had, uh, we have great assistant coaches that we've worked with, and, and um, they, one of them, Herbie Hoffman, has always talked about transformational leadership. So when we're talking about how we do something, we also will bring in, this is how you got to be when you're a husband. This is how you got to be when you're a father. You know, when, the way we leave a hotel room, we always have windows open, toilet has to be in good shape. We throw the soap away so someone else doesn't have to touch their soap that's turned into yogurt, right? And uh, we leave the windows open because we would, we would go four guys to a room in the fall in California and it gets musty. It's a nice way of saying it, right? And, but I get phone calls from guys when they're on uh, vacations with their wives years after they play and say, Coach, we're leaving the hotel and I'm explaining to my two-year-old why we have to leave the windows open. So it so that's does, amazing to it me. has to transfer. Why did it sink in? Did you scare them into this? No, no. How did you convince them that this is the right thing to so do? So here's our view on leadership, and, and this isn't my own thought. It's been a collaborative effort with all the coaches we work with. Initially, you say, this is where we're going, and you point the direction, and then you have little conversations everywhere. You have conversations at the airport. You have conversations at breakfast. You have conversations in the van, and eventually you're pulling them, and eventually they start doing the things without you having to tell them. And eventually you're walking side by side with them. And then once they get to that place, then they've taken ownership of the success of the program. And, and you win on the field and you win off the field. The teams we had were excellent in the classroom. There's no difference between performance on the field, behavior in the community, and performance uh, in the classroom. Now until you get to that tipping point where they actually get the idea, get the lesson, yeah. and they actually start adopting that behavior change, are you a lonely person? Do you feel like you're living in a cave as no. a leader that, my God, nobody really is going to pay attention to me, and I feel like nobody, I'm just alone? Yeah, yeah. No, you, you know what? Because I torture them with conversation after conversation. I, uh, I won't let them, you know, um, I, I don't miss a chance to try to encourage them to do things the right way and then explain why it's important that we, how we treat the women's team, uh, you know, we got a men's team at Seattle U when I was there, and we had a women's team, and how we treated the women's team was very important. No different than how we make runs down the flanks. So we can't, you just, it, I'm wired that way as a coach. Uh, I'm wired that way to keep trying to look for allies, one or two players who will buy in, and then hopefully that permeates to the rest of the team. I've got to ask this because you've spoken about the importance of trust as a successful yeah. leader. And as we know with the, what's happened at Penn State, that yeah. trust was was abused. Right. What's your what's your view on on how that has been handled and from a leadership point of view? Well, you know, at the end of the day, uh, a leader has to be accountable for the behavior of his people. So um, they missed the mark 
in a huge way in that situation. And uh, it's uh, to me, that is such a tragedy that, that occurred because no one around young people should be um, allowed to violate that trust. What do you think is the fundamental ingredient to building that trustful relationship then as a leader? Yeah, you have to invest in your guys. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so you have to spend a lot of time. That You have to understand that your player's story will be will be your story. Their story is going to be your story someday. So, so you have to invest in them. You got to love them. And, and you also have to be, you have to be firm but fair. You have to act out of reason and not impulse. And you've got to listen to the players. Sometimes they will give you information. And if you listen to them, then they'll be more inclined to listen to you. That's interesting. I've, I, in fact, you, you uh, point this out in the book, the, on the importance of stories. And yeah. this is exactly the opposite to this top-down leadership culture that might have existed 20 or 30 years ago. You're listening to each other. Why are those stories so important? Yeah, they, they keep the lineage of the program going. If you showed up at practice, I would introduce you to the guys and they would have to listen to you. And, that, and alumni would come in, and I would always ask the alumni who, you know, played, whether they played during the time I coached or even before the time I coached, I always say, what do you want to tell these guys? And they would inevitably say the same thing. This is the greatest time of your life. Work your tail off. Listen to the coach. And uh, they don't always say listen to the coach, actually, but they did say it was the greatest time of your life. And so the stories, because I will tell them, I'll say to the, our, our team that at that moment, as you're carrying the torch for this program, and one day the torch is going to be passed to somebody else. And while you're carrying the torch, you've got to create your own story so that I can tell people about you someday. How do you communicate those stories authentically? How do they know and how do you know it's not just an act, empty words, sound bites? It's, it, you know, it, it's got to come from within, right? It, that passion has to come from within. For me, uh, it's not hard to be fired up to tell the good of the people that have played on teams before. And it's not hard to... Uh, uh, talk about the successes of the team and the failures of the team. You have to learn from both successes and failures, so you can't fake it. I don't think you can fake leadership. You either care about your people or you don't, or you care about your direction or you don't. Yeah. Success, failure, transformation, stories. Is there a narrative arc to the life of a player on a team? Um, there the is. The beginning, middle, and end, for example? Yeah, yeah, and, and it's, it is fun to be able to see um, where those stories start and where they end. For for some of our guys, uh, today I met with a former player who's a dentist, right? And, and he was on the first team that I coached. And then another dentist-to-be, we were, we were recruiting him. So then they started communicating. And then a third, 10 years later, a third came into the program. And so sometimes you tell the story of the player, and then sometimes you tell the story of what they're doing in their career after. So it just depends. Some stories are finite, and some stories continue to go on and on. That must make for compelling reading. <laughs> it does. Yes, it does. Credibility as a leader, um, I've always wondered this, especially when I'm watching professional sports and television, sometimes the coach is the most overweight guy there. Yeah. And it's like, how on earth yeah. does this fit young man follow that coach? Do you, have, do you have had to have the experience of being the best player a few years ago so people will follow you? Or is there another kind of quality that, that, that players are looking in that, for in that leader? Players want uh, sincerity and they want intensity and they want you to be more committed than they are, right? And so uh, everything speaks. There's no question that everything speaks. So uh, how I would dress uh, coming to training uh, speaks about how serious I am. Uh, how I would dress going on the road speaks to how serious uh, I would be. Players are going to look at your discipline, and they they are going to you're going to set the standards. You're going to set the standards. How you treat people in restaurants, how you uh, run training, you will set the standards for your players, no question. So leadership, uh, everything you do speaks to your players and they will follow your lead because they're, they're always looking, they're critical and they're competitive. And if they, don't, if they don't sense that you are completely in control and on top of things, they'll back off, they'll back away. Do these same concepts and lessons apply to, to kids? Because we're talking mostly yeah. about older, older men, basically. Yeah. Right? So what are we talking about with kids? Do you have to do leadership differently for that? No. You know what's great? So uh, Tuesday night, uh, I was coaching. I coach a U15 boys team. And last year, uh, we did not win a game. And so I took the team over, and uh, we've won nine games so far this fall. And on Tuesday, I said, do you see how you've gotten better? Do you see how your language is better with each other? Your self-talk is better with each other? Uh, do you see that you're more disciplined? And I, I mentioned one of the young men, and I said, um, you know, we took you out of a game because you did some, you pushed somebody and then you had to sit down and I torture you by talking to you on the sidelines and you didn't get to play for quite a while. One of his teammates, beautiful, one of his teammates says, yeah, I didn't like so-and-so. And they were sitting right next to each other and the kid looked at him like, 
what do you mean you didn't like me? We changed his behavior so that he could play. You know, so it, it, I don't think it changes. And it sounds like that behavior change is what it takes. That attitude is that that's what it takes to win. And I yeah. love this line yeah. of winning means you can say less and impact more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, if you've won, I don't wear the rings. I don't wear the rings on purpose because uh, I don't need to now. We've got two na three national championships. We won another one this summer with the exact same thing at a completely different level in the PDL, which is the fourth division of professional soccer. And we won the uh, national title. On, it was on national TV. It was this exact, I was shocked it was the exact same recipe. Well, we'll conclude this segment on a winning note. And when we return, who needs job titles? Why do we expect people to show up at the office every day? Why work nine to five? These are all questions our next guest asked of himself as a leader of a groundbreaking startup company. The digital revolution has turned communications upside down. It poses challenges and opportunities to professionals seeking to influence and persuade. These are our students in the Master of Communication and Digital Media program. Innovators who think entrepreneurially about how to engage communities through storytelling. As creative leaders, together we're charting the future of communication. Want to join us? Find out more at mcdm.uw.edu. Gavin Kelly climbed to the top of the peak of entrepreneurship by jumping off the career ladder at Microsoft. He co-founded the Seattle-based design firm Artifact five years ago. It was named one of the top small businesses in the United States by Inc. Magazine, and it just expanded to San Francisco. Yet, despite this business success, Artifact's overall mission is to create a preferable future for humanity. How does Gavin lead his for-profit company with a bold mandate like that? Gavin, welcome. Thank you. Great so so this, this creating a preferable future for humanity, how does a leader practically inspire his employees with, a, with that kind of mission? Well, I think it's about understanding your purpose. It's not about what you do, or, or it's really about why you do it. And if you can understand that and you can express your purpose and you can rally people behind it, then you're going to have alignment uh, towards uh, a different type of outcome as a business. And what kind of outcome are you actually looking for? Uh, we want to change, uh, change business on, on one hand and change the way we think about work as a, as a place uh, to go and, you know, design and, and a place in which we, uh, you know, and we, the ways in which we change our lives through that. Now, why is that <laughs> so important to you? Uh, it's important to me. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you a story. It's, uh, it started when I got fired. By who? I got fired by an employee. So uh, it, it sounds a little bit odd, but when an employee uh, leaves your company, they're firing you huh. as an owner. And one of the things we realized is that what we'd done is we'd bought a lot of baggage from companies that we'd worked at before, and we had to rethink what it meant to run a business. Was that your first employee to leave then? Is that why no. you felt like, well, so why was that particular departure such a, uh, had such an impact on you? He, he said a couple of things. One was that I don't have a phone, and the other was I can't work from home. And well, like, that's an odd reason to leave. Why don't you have a phone? And he said, well, you never asked. And he said, well, I thought everyone should get a phone. And so he felt there was some kind of inequality. The other was... Uh, so wasn't that not... In my mind, that sounds a little petty. Is that the kind of person you actually want to have around? Though? Well, it's about inequality and about policy. And, and the other was an ability to work from home. We didn't have a policy about working from home. And we didn't say you couldn't work from home, but he said... Uh, he didn't think he could. And you mentioned that this was based on policies that you had brought from your previous employer. I, I, I suspect you're talking about your life mm -hmm. at Microsoft, right? Sure. So that's a very different culture there. So why did you bring that Microsoft culture when you started your own company? It's convenient. It's what you know. All of those things about reviews and structure and titles, they're all things that you inherited that there's an expediency in bringing those things and putting them into place so you can get busy, get busy running your business quickly. So how did you as a leader then find the courage to break away from the comfort of what you already knew in, in a very uncomfortable, risky situation, which is your own company where you're in charge? How did you make that jump? How do you make, well, you step out into the void. 
you know, and that's it. You, you, you learn through those failures. Uh, that's, that's one of the ways. And so how do you feel now then, after having been fired by your employee, um, do you feel like the changes you've made have actually had an impact on the way that you run your company? Absolutely. So when we looked at the company, all the policies we had in place, they were, counter in, they were counterproductive. Uh, one of th when we looked at our culture, we feel there's three things uh, that we wanted to do as business. One was to deliver absolute best quality that we could as a company. And the second was uh, profitability. And the third was to create a great place to work. Now, as a business owner, it's a little bit counterintuitive to say that profitability comes second. Uh, we knew as a, uh, as a company that should we do great work, profitability would follow. So then the question is about how do you do great work? And how do you do great work? Uh, it's about understanding motivations. Uh, if you think about how people do the, are at their best, you understand what, and you as a leader has to motivate them to do great work. Uh, but it doesn't come from us. It doesn't come extrinsically. That motivation is intrinsic. So it comes from within you. So we started after this, we, we looked at uh, what are the motivators for people when they come to work every day. And we found, we found that there was a lot of research out there that it has very little to do with the carrots and sticks that you apply. It has very little to do with uh, bonuses and so forth. It has more to do with the things that are meaningful for people. And we looked at someone like Daniel Pink, who's done a lot of work around uh, motivation and intrinsic motivation. And he came up with three things, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy is about treating people like grown-ups. So how do these business philosophies apply in practice? How do you translate that in the workplace? Uh, it's not through a mission statement, it's not through words, it's through your actions, it's through the policies that you put in place. And that's, that was some of the things that we learned. Your policies are, are a way in which you express how you feel about people and how you, how you feel about business. So as an example, uh, the ability to work from home is one of those. But another is understanding that life is a little bit messy and life and work is a little bit blurred. And so enabling people to take uh, a sabbatical from work to recharge or to deal with uh, family or life issues enables us to retain that relationship. So that's a, that's a fundamental one where we value that these people are part of our community. So has, has this leadership shift actually produced the results that you want? Yes, yes. And I think uh, one of those outcomes is that we were able to retain our employees and retain them longer. Uh, and that's given the costs, you know, recruiting and so forth, a, a very significant cost for a company. The last thing you want to do is lose people. Uh, and there are, there are other costs to that as well. Now, Artifact is a design firm. You're specifically involved in the creative process. Are these principles, do you think, specific primarily to your firm or to people involved in creativity? Could they easily be used or applied in other organizations? Uh, absolutely. I think. I think it comes down to changing the way we think about our relationship with, uh, with people. And as business owners, uh, one of those things that has to change is your level of trust. And this isn't just about creative people. This is about sort of our 20th century attitudes to work, which is you're going to come in and you're going to sit down and I'm going to watch you do work because I don't trust you. Uh, and what, the way that has to change is that if I trust you to do great work, uh, and trust you that the work will get done, that changes that dynamic. So no longer do I have to have you in the office. I don't have to watch you doing work. I, I trust that the work is going to get done. Why did that shift even happen? Did we all, all of a sudden become more mature and accountable? Or did, was there some kind of cultural shift? I think those, I, again, I think those are legacy issues that are being carried over from, uh, from the previous century. And I think uh, we have new ways in which we do work uh, telecommuting, and we're always connected now through, through phones and tablets and, and whatever it is, I'm never really away from work. Whereas 20 years ago, 30 years ago, work was a place you went to, whereas now work is something that you do. We've heard and we've seen all the tech companies that give free food, free drinks. You guys go the extra step. You actually have kegs in your office where they get yeah. beer, right? Yes. So could they have a beer any time of day? Any time of the day. You can have a beer for breakfast. If you want. <laughs> and how does that improve productivity? Well, we, we joke that when uh, whether there's a correlation between beer consumption and productivity uh, and how tightly those lines were coupled. Uh, we saw a, 
a spike in uh, beer consumption for the first couple of weeks. And it's but good it's beer too, isn't it? It's very good beer. Uh, but once the novelty wore off, it was just beer on tap. Uh, but it's one of those things where you understand that people work very hard, they work with long hours, and uh, creating a social space is very important as well. Well, that's interesting because we've talked about a bit about policies in the workplace, but it seems to me that space, the configuration, is also important for the kind of leadership that you want to affect. Hmm. What are you doing in that respect? Uh, I think the, sp the space itself reflects our attitude uh, to hierarchy. So we have a totally open office. Uh, we have no offices for anyone, either, not, the, not the owners or uh, anyone else. Uh, and now we're redesigning the space and having the space redesigned by the employees. So you have no titles and no. there's no preference. You don't have a corner office no. with a great view of Lake Union no. or anything like that. No. And, and you don't miss that and no. your employees appreciate the fact that you sacrifice so much? Yes. <laughs> but, but, but again, it's uh, getting away from those old ideas around... Uh, ego and tidal and ladders and focusing not on climbing but focus on doing great work. So all of this, how does it actually result in great work? Look at some of the design work that you have done and some of the consultations you've done. The, uh, the, the, the feature of camera, for example, mm -hmm. the printer. Um, would, would those have happened if you had had a top-down Microsoft approach to doing I don't business? think so. I don't think so, and I, I, here's why, and I think it comes back to uh, autonomy, and uh, that is about handing over the, con letting go of the control and giving the employee control. In those cases, those are internal projects where we offer a few constraints. One is, we want you to work in our area of expertise, uh, and we want you to do it within two to three months. Now go do what you think is best. And, and that's a key part, is doing what you think is best. And now that they have that freedom, they have a freedom to explore and they have a freedom to do great work. And if that happens at the coffee shop or if that happens somewhere else, that's, that's fine. Because the other thing about creativity and productivity is it doesn't always happen in that, that one place. So if I ask you, when, when was the last time you had a great idea? It was probably on a plane or in the shower. Exactly. So uh, that, is, that, that is almost a predictable response because ideas happen outside of, of these four walls that we, that we call a workplace. So if you're no longer controlling the process as a traditional 20th century leader, how do you guide it in the way that makes sense to the rest of the world and especially to the clients that you're working with? I, I, think, uh, I think you still need some degree of direction. You, see, you still need to have uh, a focus on quality, but you also, you still, that, that freedom is one of those, those things that we have to change, which is uh, if I'm not in control, there's going to be chaos. And if I don't hold the reins tightly, then uh, pandemonium will ensue. It's actually the opposite. And uh, again, so the other policy we have is manding, all, all meetings are optional. After a lifetime at Microsoft, uh, nothing but, if, meetings, nothing Microsoft, but meetings all day, yeah. the last thing I want to do is force people to have meetings. And so we make every meeting optional, including our company meetings. And uh, again, that's the freedom that people have the choice How to make. How do you handle that? If you have a really important thing you need to discuss, say that you've just lost a client or something like that, and the key person just doesn't show up, how do you do your business? We tell them what the agenda is, and you make the decision on whether you want to attend or not. Now, so what, what are grounds for firing then? In your, in your, uh, in your grounds company? for firing are, are failure to deliver on quality. So that's the thing. It's your, your metrics for measuring someone's performance isn't about how frequently they're on time. Your metrics performance is how good their quality of their output is. And if you can get beyond that, and I, trust me, this is something as a, as a business owner that takes a while to let go of, which is this person's coming in, it's quarter to 11, uh, what's going on? Uh, you have to let that go. And that's one of the hardest things as, as, as an owner. Uh, but what you don't know is that they were probably there till midnight last night. This is all very interesting, especially in this tech-infused professional world here in the Pacific Northwest, because with the passing of Steve Jobs, with his autobiography, the biography, um, there's a sense that his unique personality and how hard he was on people. Uh, there was a blog post I saw recently that CEOs all of a sudden feel like they have a license to be really yeah. awful people because they yeah. think that they have to bully people to get things mm -hmm. done. What you're talking about is exactly the opposite. Absolutely. But Steve Jobs was seen as a very creative person who was able to bring soul to technology. Mm -hmm. So how do you contrast what you do with somebody as successful as Steve Jobs? I think there's an, an acknowledgement that there's different types of leadership. And uh, what he did for Apple and uh, was appropriate 
and that was his mode of, of leadership. My, I, had, I read the same book and I had the same fear that we're just going to have uh, many, many unpleasant people out there acting uh, inappropriately. But the thing they don't they need to realize is that they're not Steve Jobs. Right? The, the, you know, a he, unique he, talent. He's a, a, yeah. yeah, so he had a special uh, license to do that. For me, uh, it's when we think about that, that quality and the, and the quality of life, it's the quality of these relationships. And I want to enable people to do the best work, and that doesn't mean me berating them. And it, so that's for you, for you as a leader. How about your employees? Can they, do they hold themselves and each other accountable as well? Uh, yeah. So there's, uh, without going too deep, but there's, a, there's certainly a psychology of, of peer pressure, uh, those that are, that are carrying the load. But that doesn't come from us. And I, I think it's better that it comes uh, from their peer group. When we, when we try and evaluate performance, it happens from their peer level. It doesn't really happen from above. Well, I think that's a really unique way of looking at how to do business mm -hmm. and how to lead. So you've heard from Coach Peter Fewing from the Pika community and Gavin Kelly at the top of entrepreneurship. When we return, we'll bridge these peaks. Can we create a new model for leadership by combining their successful philosophies? Welcome back. I'm with celebrated soccer coach Peter Fewing and Artifact Company founder Gavin Kelly. Peter, you've heard about Gavin's company and this pretty unorthodox leadership style. For you, as an expert on leadership, but more in the sporting world, what do you think about this? Oh, I like it. I want to work. I want to come in at 11 <laughs> o'clock and I want to come up with ideas. 11? Why not 9? Why not 8? <laughs> well, but I would be that guy who stays till midnight. And I'd be that guy who's walking Green Lake and on the phone, making sure that I was taking care of uh, whatever ideas came forward that needed to be implemented. So I like that. I think it's great. We had a player in 2002. 2004, excuse me, he scored 22 goals, Bobby McAllister, and he was a forward. And we have piano players and we have piano movers, and Bobby was a piano player. And we used to, I used to mock him with the team. I'd say, Bob, remember that time where you had dirt on your hip and on your knee because you, you defended? Remember that one game where you defended two years ago? And the guys would all laugh, but everybody understood Bobby's job was to score goals, not to defend. So where does the discipline play into this? Because you expect that you want more discipline in a sporting situation, but here we're talking about something that's very loose and free. Does that work even in sports? Oh, yes, it does. I think it does as long as, you know, and I was being a bit facetious with Bobby. It was also a, you know, a, a bit of a twist because he knew he was required to defend as well. But I was emphasizing that his strength was scoring goals. But also, then when he did defend, we made a big deal about it. So we caught him doing something that wasn't expected and was a, a little bit out of his wheelhouse. And when he did that, then uh, it elevated everybody else. When Bobby was defending, everybody else did a better job. How do you handle the, the unexpected? Because you can't control this situation. I think you have to be prepared to, to accept it, uh, whatever it might be. Because uh, when you create that loose environment, uh, you're signing up. You're signing up for the for the unpredictable. Uh, there are times when uh, we we have things happen, and we just had no idea. Uh, so that's about unintended con consequences. You know, we design for particular outcomes, which we hope that are going to happen. But you can't always anticipate all the un unanticipated outcomes that are, are going to strike you. Yeah, and leadership's fluid. I mean, there's there's there does come a point where you have to say, hold on a second. Gavin, that's not acceptable, right? Uh, yeah. You drank 15 beers uh, in the office and you know that you, your work was no good. That's not acceptable. That's where leadership, you have to recognize situations and you have to say, okay, we want you to be creative. We want you to get your job done. Here's where you've crossed the line. This is where it isn't gonna work. This is where you've got to improve. So that's where the leadership comes in. Yeah, I think that's a great point because uh, while it's very free and there's a great deal of trust, there has to be that loop of feedback and it has to be immediate. There. So if you give people a great deal of latitude and they're off, you know, they don't come in for three days and you haven't seen anything and you'll get started and get a little wound up, you have to pull that person aside and talk to them. You cannot let that go on because you have to hold them accountable. And it, without that feedback, you're just going to get wound up. Is there a specific way that you have to design the way you handle feedback in these situations? Or is it just, let me get back to you, let me get to you as soon as possible. As soon as it happens, I'm going to tell you about it. Uh, <laughs> I think you just have some principles in that it's going to be timely and it's going to be direct. Uh, we've had feedback uh, 
in terms of our communication style, that we're sometimes pretty direct. You know, if someone comes to an interview at Artifact uh, and we don't offer them a job, we'll sit them down for 30 minutes at the end and we'll tell them why we didn't, we're not hiring them. So none of that Pacific Northwest passive aggressive no, we're so used no. to. So, this, so it's not, thanks, you were great when we send you home, we're going to sit you down and tell you why you're not a good fit. And nine times out of ten, this is a little bit of a shock for people uh, because that's not how you end an interview, right? Uh, and, but they nearly always respond very well. And, and so that's about that direct communication. And so it's, it's loose and, and, and free to a point. I, I think, think that's people from a team. It's yeah, yeah, it's same thing. It's a respect factor. I think that's a great way to recruit because the person you just let go is now going to go out and promote yep. for your team. Yep. Really? You know, yeah, they're going to say, you got to go work for this company. I didn't get the job, but this is what I learned. And so now, no bitter feelings, you think? Well, if you're honest with them, people can't argue yep. with you too much. When you cut a guy, if you cut a player and you're honest with them, if you're very, you know, Casey yeah. Keller. Uh, with the Sounders. He's just retired after 20 years. And he played in Spain, he played in Germany, played in England, the top leagues around the world. He finished his last three years here at home in the U.S. His favorite coach was Clive Charles at the University of Portland. And the reason he was so happy with Clive is because he treated number 18 the same as number one. Yeah. And he was honest with him. And, and I think if you're honest, you know, then then you can, you can pull a lot more from people. You know, you, you talked a second ago about how you communicate. So if someone doesn't show up for three days, and you're in an open space like you have in mm -hmm. your office, I would imagine that if you said, hey, can we chat for a minute? Everybody in that big room is going to be looking over to see if yeah. the body language of Gavin. My players knew that if I was poking a guy in the chest, it was a compliment. Because you cannot poke a guy in the chest and give them something negative. Because they can knock your teeth out. You're violating their space. Mm -hmm. But if the hand goes on the shoulder, Gavin, that's not like you. That's mm -hmm. not who we are. The next time, the guys would see the hand on the shoulder and say, Gavin's in trouble. Yeah. How does a leader learn to develop that courage because some, yeah. most people just want to be liked but when you be that direct and that critical and offer that kind of feedback you're asking for trouble how do you sort of develop the thick skin that says you know what I gotta do this it's, it's for the good of the team one of the things when I started a company was uh, that desire to when I started out to have that control and uh, be the boss what I didn't realize that I was also signing up to that responsibility of firing people and that is one of the most difficult things that you can do as an, em as an employer. But once you understand that if you approach it honestly and, and you're true, uh, it's okay. How was your first time firing someone? Firing someone? Uh, it was rough. And we went through the recession. I'll, I'll tell you, it's, uh, we, we were in a time when we're trying to grow the company, the recession hit, and we acted quickly, and we had one of the worst days of my life, which was to let five people go, all at once. And uh, we planned for it, and we did it. There's no good way to do that, right? But we still were, were honest with them. We said that uh, the economy has turned. Uh, we are not going to... Uh, let this linger on and create this atmosphere of fear because that's the next thing that kicks in when you sort of you let one person go and then you let another person go we made the difficult choice to cut deep and uh and quickly uh and it was it, it was a, a very very you know trying time but it was the right thing to do you, you don't want to offend people, and that's part of the gig. But at the end of the day, you have to stay in business, and we have to win yeah. games. And yeah. if you let bad behavior or if you make poor decisions continue, then you go out of business or you don't win. Yeah. And so sometimes, you know, it's a step back, uh, but it's also a greater step forward. When I talked about that 14-year-old team, you know, one of our young players pushed a guy, and that's not acceptable. And so I immediately pulled him out, and we had to sit him down, had to have a conversation. But now, two months later... He's a much different person. After, How do you learn that? I mean, because it's, it's yeah. a, a tough skill to, to really adopt. That's it? why I said earlier that I think I'm in my prime as a coach because I'm 49. Because at 23, 24, 25, mm -hmm. you're afraid to do it. And then it lingers and it gets worse and it festers. And then all of a sudden other players see that it's a problem. You know, we, we had a player in, before we won our first national championship, and maybe this is that 10 years that it takes, it's the coach as well. We had players that weren't being respectful and uh, to the coach and I I would let it go and so then it permeated through the rest of the team but once I once I nipped it in the butt I benched a guy we were gonna go play the University of Portland the year before Arnie Clubroot Rhodes Scholar candidate academic All-American and first-team All-American as an athlete you don't tell that guy now 
Well, you, here's what happened. The year before, he got beat three times in nine minutes for, th for three goals. Mm -hmm. and, and so the next year, I, and he was going against a kid from the University of Portland who was very, very fast. And, and so we put our fastest guy on him and tried to set him up so that he could understand how to defend. Well, I, I ran over and said, hold on, here's what you got to do. And before I could finish, he threw the ball on the ground. And he said, I know, I know, I know. And it ended. And it took me, it takes me some time. I don't know how it is for you, Gavin, but I need a day to process. So the next day we're going to Portland and we get to the vans and I say, Arnie, you're not going. And, and that's where I learned about Plato's Republic. He, that's how bright a young man he was. He wrote me a two-page letter saying it's about time you stepped up and took control of your team. Wow. I was 35. Wow. I got home to a two-page letter about how the team should be, and that helped us. But sometimes it, courage, I think you mentioned, you have to have some courage when you're leading. Gavin, when you hear Peter talk about the time that it takes to develop those leadership skills, you know, and to, to, to victorious, 10 years, can that translate well in the business world where you have such pressures to make profits even if it's only your second priority? I, I think that's a that's a great question and I uh, there's there's something that you have to do as a as a new business which is plan for the longer haul and the third priority was to create a great place to work and these are all these these sometimes are interchangeable in terms of their hierarchy uh, but they're closely related and you have to understand that uh, unless you're treating people with consistency and unless you're, you're honest, uh, that's going to compromise that part of being a great place to work. When, when you start losing people, that just has such a, uh, a sort of exponential impact in a negative way on the company. And uh, if you do everything in, you, in your powers to keep people and to keep them engaged, uh, your part of those things already won. I said that priority may be a second priority, uh, sorry, profitability may be a second priority, but it will come if you do these other things well. Is winning the priority in soccer? It's a byproduct of doing the other things right. Yeah. So what are you focusing on primarily then? Well, getting the right people. Yeah. When we go and recruit, and I'm sure in your process mm -hmm. of recruiting, we spend a lot of time looking at players. I watch how they talk to their parents. I watch how they warm up. So the priority is getting the right guys there. The priority is creating good leaders so that when the guys come in, they know the expectations of the program. But then again, creating a culture. What is that culture? Unity. They, they, have to be, they have to be willing to sacrifice for each other. Does that come into play in the business world as well? This uh, unity, this sacrifice, this sense of shared purpose? What we do is uh, really intense. We have top, you know, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies, uh, the best in the world coming to us for the best product and the yeah. best work. Yeah. That creates almost a pressure cooker. And you have, you know, in the way that you have the pressure of a big game, we have the pressure of a big client and a big project. What's an example of a client that might have come to you to do something big? Uh, Amazon uh, is, a big, is a big client of ours. And uh, they've trusted us with some strategic projects. And uh, when these companies, a lot is on the line for them. Uh, that team that works on that uh, has to bond. Uh, there has to be trust there again between the team members. And, then, and when there's a weak link there, it's going to compromise that. How do you handle post-mortems? In athletics, Oftentimes after a game, if you've just been thumped, you don't want to spend a lot of time on it, to be honest with you, because you might say something that's, players don't forget what you say. I, I would imagine that uh, employees don't forget what leaders say to them, so a biting comment can last and take them down a wrong path. So, so sometimes you, you have to, again, you have to read the situation. You know, we had a game with the kids at Pumas where the locker room before the game was a disaster, and it was too much joking around. I tried to quiet it down. So after the game, I'm standing on a bench and I'm looking and I, I keep saying the reason we lost today uh, and I came back to it three times. We didn't lose, we tied. I was waiting for one player to say, coach we tied, we didn't, yeah, and I hammered him. As soon as I said that, I said if you are satisfied with a tie, <laughs> then you don't belong in this locker room and I walked out and we didn't lose after that. How do you read the situation after a loss or something that didn't quite work out in the business situation? We allow some time to pass. Uh, and the post-mortem is we take the entire team goes out to lunch or to dinner and we celebrate the good work because I think it's important to, to acknowledge when good work is done. Uh, you work for three months or four months on this thing. Take a moment. 
to celebrate that victory as it yeah, were, yeah. Uh, but also take it as a learning moment because what you're creating, and you talk about the stories, uh, you're creating sort of this tribal knowledge. And so we try and capture the things uh, that we did well so we can do more of them, and we try and capture the things that didn't go well so we can stop doing them. So what was it in your respective lives that said, I want to be in charge, I want to, I want to show the way here? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, you, you lead. lead the way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I love people, and I, I love working with them. I get fired up to see development and improvement. I enjoy bringing teams together and having a purpose and a goal and a vision on where we should go. And so, uh, so for me, uh, it's really fun to be a part of something like that. And and I think leadership is learned, but it is also inherent. So, who inspired you at that time when you were thinking about leading? Who who would you want to follow? Well. Leaders that I really have a lot of respect for, Father Sullivan was president at Seattle U for 20 years. He did Bill and Melinda Gates' wedding. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a vision of greater good all the time and, and uh, what was best for the individual. The way he took care of me personally as his men's soccer coach was, was humbling and he was the president of the university for such a long time. Uh, I don't know Jim Senegal, but I admire how he takes care of his people and his vision and his, his non-negotiables for mm -hmm. his people. And then Rick Redman, you're talking about the... Um, the, the victory, uh, he's the president of Selling Construction. He was a, he's a, in the Hall of Fame mm -hmm. for college football. Uh, he was a Husky, and he played in the NFL for nine years. Uh, and Rick, as he was, was the president of Selling, they had the victory room, but they also celebrated the losses. And hmm. so I learned by watching great leaders, and um, those are some of the few that have really inspired me. How about you, Gavin? What led you to leadership? Who inspired you? Uh, I'll say control. But it wasn't... You wanted to have control? You didn't want to be controlled no. by somebody else? I, wanted, I didn't want to control others. I wanted to control my own destiny. And I think uh, while a corporate life is a great learning ground uh, for, for many of the skills in business, uh, there's also, an, you have to acknowledge that there's, uh, you're ceding control to the organization, to your manager, to the hierarchy, to the meetings. And... Uh, that's something that I just didn't want to have. And uh, the amount of force and pressure you can exert on such a, uh, such a, in such a large organization is so small. Uh, so I wanted to be able to say, here's where I want to work. Here's the type of work I want to be doing. I want to be able to choose the people that I want to work with. Uh, all of those things were important because at the end of your professional career, you're going to re look back and you're going to remember not so much the projects and the the, uh, the games themselves. You're going to remember the players. That's right? it. You're, you're going to yeah. you're going yeah. to and we're going to remember the the people we worked with. And the players are going to remember you. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And and, yeah. and what you're saying earlier is understanding that uh, your voice. My partner Rob Gerling says that you have to imagine that you're walking around with a bullhorn, <laughs> even if you whisper that it sound, comes off like a bullhorn because uh, because of the position you hold. Uh, so you, you have to be aware of that uh, sort of the disproportional influence that you have. Yeah, that's great. And you can't abuse that privilege. I mean, it, it's a privilege to lead. Uh, Ed Taylor, uh, who's the, the dean of undergraduate students here at, at the University of Washington, he says that education is a moral endeavor. And I think coaching is a moral endeavor. We're, you as a leader, myself as a coach, we're the manufacturer of our players, our people's good old days. You know, they might not remember the success, but they'll remember the people and the celebrations and the excitement and the enthusiasm and the disappointments. There's great learning in success and there's great learning in failure as well. So you're both leaders here in the Pacific Northwest. There is a specific culture to this area, this, this sort of rugged individualism, uh, the gold rush, where people didn't really want to be controlled or led around. They wanted to manifest their own destiny, as mm -hmm. you say. Uh, are we all leaders here in this region? Uh, are we, do we all sort of aspire to become leaders, you think, from what you've seen in, in, your, in your positions? I, I think in some ways, yes. And people want to know they have a voice, but I think they still want leadership. They still want to know what's acceptable behavior, where are we going, what's the vision. There is a certain comportment that you have to have if you're going to inspire people. Yeah. So is that dishonest in this new world of authenticity? Well, I, I think sometimes, you know, I started that in 97 when we won the first championship. By 2004, and then this summer went in the next one, it did become natural. Sometimes you have to say, well, I want to be here. So you have to put yourself there, and then eventually you grow into that skin. As boss, you're not allowed to have a bad day. And that's basically what you're saying. And uh, I think that's somewhat true. I, I'm very conscious not to complain 
uh, at work, uh, not to complain about a client or an employee or any of those things because of the weight that those words carry. And, is that bullhorn you talked yeah, about? Yeah, and, and also to be aware of uh, uh, it's sort of the emotion that you bring and your attitude. I think it's in, in today's day and age, it's very easy to be cynical, and it's one of those toxic things that can creep into any organization is to step back and, and start to criticize rather than step up and start doing. And so I think as a leader, there is the game face you have to put on. Uh, no matter how, how bad things are, you, you have to be aware of, how, of your role within that organization. You grew up in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, you came to the United States on a basketball scholarship. You, you played basketball. Is there a difference in the culture of leadership uh, between where you came from and where you are now? There is, uh, and, and it's called the tall poppy syndrome. A poppy <laughs> is a large flowering plant. Uh, I'm not sure you're familiar with this term, but it's an attitude in Australia, which is the opposite of America. America celebrates its successful people and its heroes, uh, and they look up to them and admire them. It's the opposite in Australia. Anyone in Australia who is, uh, has any degree of success uh, goes out in the world and makes a name for themselves. Uh, if they get too uh, full of themselves, the, the Australian psyche is to cut them down and bring them mm -hmm. down to size, so they'll turn. So they want to see you do well to a point. Is there something specific to leading in the Northwest that would be different from, say, if you were in the Midwest or in the South or something like that? Well, I've been told on, on the East Coast it's a much more um, uh, direct and in-your-face style of, of uh, coaching, and you have to be, you're a little more blunt and uh, uh, you keep a little bit, you, the walls are a little higher between player and coach. There's a definite separation here. Uh, there's a, it is acceptable to be connected to your players. So, Well, that's interesting because you both advocate this more collaborative approach to, to leading. And collaboration is not something in the Northeast, you know, New York, that whole hard, old world approach to business necessarily feels comfortable with. And yet, when we look at the Pacific Northwest and its, and its place in the competitive globalized stage, you know, can we compete if we're not being edgy and hard on everybody else? Can, does collaboration bring any benefits that competitive does not? Well, we've got three national championships that say it does. It works. You know, you have to, but you have to know your people, don't you? Mm -hmm. I mean, if I think I would lead different if I was at a different university. I would have to, I went to an interview at Holy Cross and uh, had a great conversation with the athletic director. And, and he sort of said to me when I didn't get the position, he said, if you came here, you'd have to be a little harder, which I think as a leader, you have to recognize your situation. And I would be comfortable being a little bit, a little bit uh, harder, a little more distant. And then eventually, you do have to lead within your personality though. But you gotta lead the people in a way that will work. And the way you've done it here in the Pacific Northwest with your teams has worked, but might be quite specific to the culture here as well. I mean, you've opened office, you've opened an office in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Will your leadership style be any different there than it is here? No, and I, I think that's an important thing. When we talk about culture, uh, I don't think you can create culture. I think you create conditions in which a culture will emerge. Mm -hmm. So th that's sort of the attitudes and policies that we have. They're the things we control. We don't really control the culture. It's sort of this amorphous thing. Uh, however, we would like to have San Francisco have a culture that uh, relates to, is a reflection of us. And, and so somehow a bit of the Northwest migrates south. Uh, and we plan to do that. The, the people who are down there now have all worked uh, here in Seattle and now they're moving down. And people who come into that San Francisco office will spend time in Seattle. So we think it's uh, their time in the company and in, in this place is really important. And we want to keep that connection, that sort of DNA has to transfer. So how's that Northwest vibe sitting with us Californians? Uh, so far, so good. Um, yeah, they're, they're a bunch of hippies. <laughs> <laughs> if you look now at where you are now within your own organizations, with what you've succeeded in your lives, and then you look at leadership and the people who inspired you 20, 30 years ago, is it harder to be a leader today when people have more information, they feel like they, they could do things themselves, they don't need that old approach to doing things? I think you have to have a thicker skin with tweeting and you know all the access to information and you can say something. I mean, you, you can be standing, I, I was interviewed by someone I had no idea was being interviewed. They had their phone right there and, I, and, and all of a sudden I was a conversation and it was a reporter from a newspaper. So you have to have a little bit of a thicker skin and you have to be a little more cautious about your words because your words can get out everywhere but uh, people are still people they still have the same fundamental needs um, and they still in my opinion they still need that leadership 
but uh, I do think you are a little more exposed and a little more vulnerable and the patience of success is it's a shorter window. Shorter, what did, so did you miss the golden age of leadership, Tom? Could you wish that you'd had that where you had a little bit more control over things no, and people no, not, that had more no, time to actually get Not there? at all, and I think while I talk about control, it's controlled me and my destiny, and I think a leader today has to relinquish control. Uh, as a, as you're creating these conditions, and I think that's an important thing. Where there's so many, there's trends happening now in our society around access to information, communications, collaboration, social networks. All of these things are going to change the way in which we think about business. And I think we as leaders have to respond to that. Clutching onto the the old manual for for leadership isn't going to work. I think it's a good place to leave things today. Obviously, there's a fundamental shift in leadership, and it's clear to me that both of you are there at the forefront pushing that. So well done to both of you. So, uh, Gavin Kelly and Peter Fewing, thanks for sharing your philosophy around leadership. We invite you all to extend your reach by connecting with us on Twitter with the hashtag 4PeaksNW. You can also follow me, HRH Media. I'm Hanson Hossein. See you next time for another episode of 4Peaks. Four